Well, hello and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and ITY TV interview. Today I'm joined by Philip Zamet. He's the Zoom Head of Customer Experience for Asia Pacific and Japan. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Alex. Great to be with you. Thanks for taking the time. Now, I'm sure everyone knows Zoom only too well, thanks to the pandemic. And I remind people that Zoom's, you know, over a decade old. Some people just think it came about during the pandemic. But can you please start by t reminding us when Zoom started and how it has evolved since that time? Because I'll bet some people only think Zoom started or came to life during uh, or just before the pandemic, when in reality, the company is much older. So uh, please tell us. Sure, Alex. Yeah, yeah. so Zoom was actually founded... Uh, in 2011, so yeah, more than a decade uh, uh, old now by our founder, Eric Yuan. Uh, and as you said, most people would be familiar with Zoom, um, probably from a rapid and experiential perspective around the pandemic, um, but we've been expanding and innovating pretty heavily since then. So our, our breadth of solutions and products is really extensive now and covering really that true unified collaboration comprising customer experience and employee experience solutions the organizations, corporations, businesses, large, small, personal use as well. Um, so our solutions now comprise things covering uh, collaboration, employee experience, things like uh, Zoom meetings, obviously, which we're synonymous for, famous for, our collaboration tool set, Zoom team chat, unified comms, Zoom phone, virtual work boards, Zoom events, webinars, Zoom spaces, now rooms, workspace reservations, our building developer and SDK tools, and obviously uh, an area that's dear to me, the whole Zoom CX suite of products, so Zoom Contact Center, Zoom Virtual Agent, and Zoom IQ. So yeah, Zoom is is uh, pretty well known, but probably not as broadly well uh, understood and known for our breadth of solutions and products that we've been expanding uh, rapidly over the last three or four years. Yeah, it's become quite the platform. And you always know it's a uh, platform is successful when all of the ecosystem accessories, like, you know, they, it's for Zoom, it's for Zoom rooms. And so, you know, you just know that you've succeeded when you become sort of an invisible part of people's lives, uh, which is, um, you know, great credit to you and the team. Now, one of the things that Zoom launched a couple of years ago, as you were just talking about, was the Zoom Contact Center, which is now available in Australia and New Zealand. So tell us a bit more about Zoom Contact Center, how businesses are using it, and uh, even more importantly, how consumers will benefit. Yeah, so um, obviously really excited about Zoom Contact Center launch, as you just said, uh, really recently launched in the ANZ region. We launched Zoom Contact Center um, about a year ago now, actually, in North America, so February 2022. 2022? Yeah, it's a year ago, isn't it, Alex? Mm -hmm. Gosh, where's it go? Now, I think probably the first thing I talk about, which is maybe sort of taking back a, a few steps, is that notion of what is actually a contact center. The, you know, way I think about it from a technology point of view, it's that bridging mechanism. So if you think about it, maybe in sort of classical, traditional terms, um, which still happens today, isn't it? I've got an inquiry, I've got a question to ask my bank, service provider, telco, whatever it is. Figuratively speaking, sometimes literally you pick up the phone, you make that call, that connection, that bridging to the, in um, a lot of circumstances, the human agent and the consumer, the customer, the technology that underpins that, creates that connection is a contact center. So that's what we've launched. It's obviously a lot more exciting and expansive from a feature and capability point of view than that. Uh, but that's Zoom contact center. It's just the way I think about it, Alex, is to talk about it as this orchestration engine from a technology perspective, this idea of almost a technology heartbeat to power that customer journey, does the orchestration, the routing, pull in uh, other capabilities, just like you said, that ecosystem of other services and vendors and solutions where it makes sense dynamically for the customer experience. Uh, things like natural language understanding, natural language processing, maybe automation, self-service, a classic phone call, SMS, all these different channels that are coming in. The orchestration of that uh, is Zoom Contact Center, which we've just released, and not only from a Zoom platform point of view, powering and, and orchestrating, managing a lot of those service experiences, like I'll talk about you know, through this conversation around things like Zoom Virtual Agent, the idea of a chatbot, and how do I make that service experience elegant, really the heartbeat, that orchestration is Zoom Contact Center. So just for people who are maybe wondering, does Zoom Contact Center actually let you connect to somebody in the contact center and see them the way I'm seeing you now, or is it a phone-based or an audio call-based uh, system? Great question, yeah. So I think in, in the current uh, world in which we live, it's just all about those um, expectations, aren't they, Alex? In terms of, again, going back in time, we were just familiar with picking up that phone, but now in terms of 
not only the, the demographic changes, but the social changes that have gone along with that in terms of different channels based on the requirement or the context. So yeah, in terms of that, uh, I'll talk about this elegant or graceful service experience. And so you can dynamically pull in video like this conversation from a service experience where it makes sense, maybe a high empathetic service experience you want to employ. So you can think about it in a kind of graduated way, the idea of maybe self-service automation to start, you know, kind of classic, although I don't really like the term, you know, chatbot scenario. Yeah. You want to elevate that to a human agent chat scenario with the consumer. Maybe you want to dynamically elevate that to a voice call, maybe to a video call. Maybe I want to do a video call with screen share. Mm. You can do all of that dynamically based on the requirement of the engagement or that customer. So, yeah, you could launch video now natively with the Zoom platform, Zoom context center doing that routing with the familiarity and the performance that we all know and love around Zoom from a video performance perspective in a service experience dynamic, which is super cool, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, look, I love to talk to the chatbots, which then either help you or uh, you know direct you to a human if you need the extra help. But there's been many a time when I've been on the phone to Telstra or whoever it might be and sort of saying, look, can't you just log in and have a look? I mean, normally I'm helping somebody else and I'm calling Telstra as a last resort. And it's it's frustrating when you can't see them. Oh, no, we can't log in. We can't have a look. I know that with uh, TeamViewer, people have been able to, you know, use their phone and actually show stuff. And, I'm, and you could do that in Zoom as well. So uh, it's you know great to see that the customer service uh, capabilities and the ability to escalate to a, a video call if you want to is something that you guys are bringing into reality. Yeah, spot on. I mean, it's, and we could talk about prowls, Alex, isn't it? I think that there's so many different scenarios where, I mean, I'm a big believer in terms of what I've learned the last 20 odd years in CX. If you work backwards from the challenge statement or the target statement, and let's say uh, that hypothesis is a sound one, I'm sure, just like you, you've articulated really well, is if the objective is an improved service experience and maybe what does that look like? Maybe it's a, a, a reduced um, service experience from a time and effort point of view, on the consumer, uh, the classic waiting on hold for an hour and a half before you get to someone is is just really not acceptable. Your call anymore, is important to us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. And so you can do that. Maybe step one, almost and to your point. In a and it is actually a really topical one, isn't it? In in a technical remediation perspective, that broadband scenario. You know, we've all done that. Call through level one, level two. Just to your point, have you turned the power on? Off? Well. What about you know employing video like you said with screen share so you can actually do it in a guided way mm. what's the objective is to reduce that friction and actually improve the service experience and actually ideally create a high empathetic uh, service experience for the consumer now zoom's also just launched the much anticipated zoom virtual agent globally we we're just you know briefly talking about that but tell us more about it yeah so zoom virtual agent or zva because it's way easier to say fast uh, zoom virtual agent is our conversational, intelligent conversational AI chatbot. Um, it's a lot more than that, but really in terms of that service support, that automation from a textual perspective, and then uh, over the horizon, not too far away from a voice point of view, the use of natural language understanding to really provide that guided concierge automated service experience. So now I can chat with the service provider. And one of the powerful elements of Zoom Virtual Agent is the hooks into a lot of that backend database, You know knowledge base, it might be ServiceNow, it might be Salesforce, it might be your own database in terms of those, those responses, the answers, the FAQs. And really one of the areas of real power of the Zoom virtual agent is to be able to not only, you know, provide that link to a 14-page FAQ document to Alex, which is kind of interesting, but maybe a little bit unhelpful, but extracting the key phrasing, the key answers to the question from an NLU point of view, that intent perspective. And that's really, really important. So we've got some amazing technology we're starting to roll out here. Um, and not only that, obviously, when you think about that service experience, like I talked about that elegant platform views, how do I integrate that natively so that chatbot experience, where it makes sense and where it's applicable, can elevate to those other guided service experiences with humans involved with Zoom context and acting as that orchestration engine behind the scenes. Yeah, and look, I mean, we've all been using ChatGPT and probably even the Bing Search AI, and we've seen how much better chatbots can be when they have a bit of information and can speak in a natural language. I'm not asking you to divulge any secrets, but no doubt the Zoom guys have been looking at that as well, and just the future is bright for you know, this self-service 
getting the answer as quickly as you need, the right relevant information. And then if you still need help, it's all available. Yeah, again, yeah. right on. Yeah. Alex, isn't it? I, you know, the, the area is growing and, and moving really rapidly, you know, to your point. I think about uh, there's probably a fair bit of technology scarring from a social perspective around the use of self service kind of 10, 15 years ago. So there's a lot of stories around sort of war stories around, well, didn't understand me 148 times, not so, not so great. So things have certainly improved. Yeah. I, I think if you look at sort of almost divorce the technology from the operational side, though, and that's something that should always be considered. I think vendors sometimes in CX overlook the human aspect, not just from a, a consumer sentiment point of view, but equally from an employee point of view. And if you think about kind of a mathematically unsound formula, but, you know, better agent experience equals better customer experience equals better customer lifetime value, that's really important. So the use of technology automation in that sense becomes applicable, yes. However, how do I do it so it doesn't necessarily intrude? How do, how do I do it in such a way that, again, it's dynamic? So if Phil is not being understood, let's say, mm. how do I make sure that you intercept that in the right way? And again, in, in a really sensitive way. Yeah. And I think that's the other piece here that becomes really interesting. And, and I, I mean, I get asked this question all the time, you know, things like this, like you just talked about, and maybe the use of video. And I think it's important to say from anyone's perspective, from a technology point of view, we don't have all the answers but it'll be really important to, to work with and learn from our customers of where things make sense and where they work and where they don't. And so you, you just want to look for those patterns, don't you, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. You want your customer experience, service experience from both your, uh, the company's point of view, but you know the customer's point of view to be a joy. And I know that one of the things that I'm often doing when talking to a chatbot is saying, human or operator, and I wish I didn't have to do that, but sometimes it's just the quick shortcut to get through all the BS and go straight to a person. So anything that can be done by companies to you know, dramatically improve that is really good. And look, this leads us to the fact that uh, you know, going into 2023, it sounds like getting customer engagement strategy right, which we've just been speaking about, is more important than, than ever to help amplify business success. So you've already spoken a bit about this, but what are some of the tips that... Uh, in addition to what you've already said, on using omni-channel communications to their fullest. Yeah, I, again, I work backwards, Alex, in terms of what's the market saying, what are customers saying. I think I mean, there's there's no shortage of surveys and analysis is there out there that you can look at and point at. Maybe in some ways to substantiate your opinion sometimes from an ideological perspective. But what the interesting thing that comes out for me just um, as a cross-sectional view, but probably more powerfully from customers, is that there's no doubt that our behaviours are changing. If you think about, you know, just that example before, the probably poor one of a, you know, historic, you know, example of picking up the phone, calling your bank service provider, you're going to do that now more times than not using your mobile phone. You, you it, know, your especially mobile phone. when banks are closing. And you know, <laughs> exactly, you know, yeah, that's yeah. right. And so, and as we know it to be true in terms of the drift uh, heavily towards you know digital applications on those devices and the use of those applications not only for calling but for the engagement of so the increasing expectation i'd say alex in terms of digital channels for self-service may it be facebook whatsapp um you know live chat social whatever the case may be and so the, the demand and challenge for organizations is to be aware of that firstly and secondly from a realization that you know, customer and service experience is paramount. And really, if you look at, again, any sort of analysis, that the top three drivers seem consistently from a technology point of view and organisational point of view, the idea of sort of that umbrella statement of digital transformation, security is certainly an area there, and the importance of customer experience. And again, I break that down to that customer lifetime value as a much stronger indicator for organisational health and future profitable health of an organization in terms of customer lifetime value so service experience customer retention those principles of advocacy and loyalty are just top of mind i think for not only historically you know customer service customer experience but now business leaders just across the board so the challenge in that environment is how do i adapt my technology and my service operational experience to be flexible to those demands exactly your example you know before if Alex is a really valued consumer and customer, and we all should be thinking in those ways, and his preference is, is channel X, channel Y, and I can't provide that to him, then I've got a challenge, don't I? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a great service experience. And what you don't want, you know, that 
the research is really clear that you know you have a five times higher likelihood and propensity for someone to tell other people about a terrible or bad service experience mm-hmm. over a good one, just tuned and wired that way. So that really crass but kind of humorous saying about just sucking slightly less than your competitor in CX strategy is probably not a sound strategy for the future. Yeah, and it was making me think of the the story about how bad news travels around the world before good news has gotten out of bed. Yeah. And when I said yeah. about banks closing before, I didn't mean Silicon Valley Bank, but the fact that bank branches are closing. I mean, all the all the banks are still there, but they're just cutting their costs tremendously. And and no doubt investing in more of these um, omni-channel customer support solutions to be there for their customers because we need banks and uh, on you know various services more than ever just because they're not as widely physically available doesn't mean that we don't um, need their um, help when we need it yeah sorry i think banks is a great example isn't it you, you think for many years now but in fact many of the banking services that you know we we need to do have actually become almost more accessible from the app haven't they yeah from a- yeah self-service just do it correct Correct. And so, you know, that that in its own way is, you know, it's sliding doors a little bit. It's like the the argument about or the question of, you know, because we can now really rapidly and natively and very easily without any friction deploy video in a contact center, just like we've been speaking about. Mm. Has that been the question of whether that hasn't been there because there's not been a demand for video or is it because it's been typically quite technology problematic? to deploy video in a service experience in a really elegant and high performance way. And also there's the social aspect of, you know, do agents really want to be on video all the time, working from home, all that type of stuff. Mm. So I think the same kind of scenario can play out there, that parallel, Alex, isn't it, with a banking app scenario, did that drive the wheel, you know? And so there's there's a few changes that are going on here that are becoming more profound, I think, in, in consumer and customer expectation of whether customers are driving that or, you know, technology inhibition and organization strategy is driving that. It's really fascinating. The fact that we couldn't do any of this in the past and now we can and it presents challenges, it's called a good problem to have. (laughs) Now, over the past year, people have continued to enjoy a greater work-life balance uh, that arises from not needing to spend so much time commuting to and from work. I mean, that I don't think is ever going to go away because you just get so much of your life back. You know, while recognizing there is still a great benefit from balancing in-person collaboration and hybrid work, I mean, that companies do want people to be in there and, you know, we, we have this balance. So what has Zoom seen in this regard over the last year and what are Zoom's predictions for the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a common topic, isn't it? I, I really I really break this area into two parts, Alex. I think there's the, the sort of traditional definitional hybrid working piece exactly you know, to your question. And if you don't mind, I kind of add a little bit to it and think about Please. the notion of hybrid from a CX perspective. So the, the, the first piece, the first thing, you know, I talk about and we think about is that there's no one size fits all. I think, you know, there's a process that we're seeing around the world, isn't it, for organisations to to debate and balance the idea of do you mandate people coming back? Should you not do that? What's the impact for organisations? The macroeconomic conditions have a bearing on that. You know, we all understand that to be true. Mm-hmm. Really, the, the thing that we look at here is what's right for the organisation in the context of what they're trying to deliver. Employee satisfaction, employee advocacy, we know is super important. So that equity, which is different, you know, the equitable statements and equity is really important though. So the the opportunity, the platform from a flexibility point of view to enable people to perform their role regardless of the situation and circumstance, noting that that behavioural social piece is an important element. So a lot of the tools and and products from the Zoom platform perspective around collaboration uh, and a lot of things coming down the pipe will actually, you'll see, really try to uh, raise, improve the, the equity so that there's a more dynamic service experience for the employee, be they, you know, remote, physical, virtual in that scenario. So again, in summary, I think there's no, you know, one answer. It's going to vary based on the organisation. There's no doubt that, you know, that the shift is occurring towards a more hybrid on the scale of, you know, physical presence as opposed to pure virtual. And I think the other piece that I think, you know, I like to talk about is this notion. And in fact, your, your example was spot on before about that bank branch analogy is the idea of customer experience from a hybrid point of view, not not sort of simplistically, you know, is an agent going to work from home or virtual? That, that's kind of done. You know, we know that to be true. It's just an employee is an agent. 
It's how do I create a seamless, singular customer experience, that customer journey, just like I talked about, maybe from a virtual service experience, like a contact center, chatbot to human, voice to video to screen share, things like that, you know, social um, channels inside that. But let's say now Phil or Alex goes to a branch, you know, a physical brick and mortar environment, and now maybe confronted with a screen, a kiosk style, how do I uh, continue that seamless service experience in the physical world now? And that's where, again, that orchestration engine of Zoom Context Center, along with some of the technology, not just from, from Zoom, but like you touched on some of our partners with physical devices becomes really powerful. Maybe it's a, a service center experience. I go to that office, I click on a, a button, I, I authenticate myself, I'm now having a video engagement with someone in a kiosk form, and then I can continue that conversation in the car, on phone, on video, whatever the case may be. And that service experience, to do that today is really difficult. And that's kind of the, the vision and, and future, again, heavily driven by customer feedback of what they're looking to achieve, where it makes sense and where it's applicable to a you know, retail kind of context or banking scenario. So I think that's where hybrid is also taking its own little avenue from a customer experience point of view. And that's really fascinating for, for me and the Zoom organisation. Now, I already jumped the gun a bit by talking about chat GPT and artificial intelligence, but also, you know, VR headsets have been a promise for a long time. Uh, I think if Apple does indeed launch its VR headset later this year, then the rest of this decade is really going to be the, the blossoming of this whole VR experience. And I think even more importantly, the augmented reality experience. And uh, I realize all these things are, are still, you know, yet to, as I was saying, truly blossom. But uh, do you have any additional thoughts or comments you wanted to share on, you know, VR, AR, extended reality and AI? Yeah, I mean, uh, you talk about this for hours again, Alex, can you? It's almost a little bit philosophical over the horizon type stuff. But if you look yeah. at VR, AR, if, if you were to, to say this, I'm not saying you have to agree, but if you were to equate that to just to another channel, just to another input into the customer journey, again, where it makes sense, then again, the orchestration engine should be powerful enough to be able to adapt to that. You know, so Alex Incorporated says, hey, I want to actually deploy AR, VR for my premium customer segment or whatever the scenario is. But I want to make that just another piece in the overall customer journey or customer experience pie. Mm. So again, from an API point of view, how do I bring that in and do that in such a way that I can have a continuity, a singularity of view so I can analyze to get better and faster? And then on the AI side, yeah, for, I mean, again, such a you know ballooning area of conversation, isn't it? From a Zoom point of view, we really think about AI uh, today and even more so into the future in that uh, how do we use it to improve empower that assisted scenario so something like you know language translation for instance or maybe at the conclusion of a zoom meeting how do i transcribe that event but actually extract some of the key points maybe i want to identify key phrases you know word spotting improvement score you know language translation in a live perspective becomes really interesting in real transcription perspective so a lot of that you know noise suppression virtual backgrounds getting more and more funky I think AI becomes a really broad, almost superset area, isn't it? And so it's the particular areas of technology that uh, are used by organisations becomes really the interesting thing. But I, again, I think we always have to be a bit cautious about that sort of umbrella term of AI and how we think about it from a, um, as we are, thinking about it as a means to improve and empower, increase the efficiency and, and ideally just to simplify both employee and customer experiences from that unified collaboration perspective. Yeah. And because the ecosystem is so strong, I mean, there are a number of plugins that do some of those, you know, various translation and summarization and, and transcription tools. But I mean, it's only natural that a company like, you know, Apple and Microsoft have subsumed many of the, the features in, in you know, over time because the technology just got better and it was demanded to be inside the platform. And I'm, you know, not asking for any roadmaps on what you plan to add when, but I mean, it's just a, just a comment on the fact that, you know, technology gets better and sometimes it's smarter to have it built in. And the third part guys always have to work harder to make their products and services worth paying extra for and um, the market has proved that they're always very good at doing that so just a comment yeah it's, it's, a, it's a great comment i, yeah. I think the, the the sort of vision and philosophy and just to your point that you raise is again certainly from our view if, if you want to think about the optimal total cost of ownership 
um, you know, measure for an organization, there's no doubt, there's no question in terms of what we're starting to see from customers is if I can consolidate onto a singular platform, there's, there's unquestionable uh, performance and efficiency benefits, again, from a simplicity, single administration view, a, a single pane of glass, a single environment, a single client, uh, a single stack, and, however, the opportunity, that flexibility from an API perspective to, if an organisation has landed on, you know, technology ABC, you don't want to prohibit that. You know, don't spend a dollar twice type scenario, Alex, isn't mm. it? So mm. to your point, the, the flexibility and the respect for organisations, if they have landed on, you know, vendor ABC, for any of those elements you just talked about, the um, ideally in the, the you know, best case scenario is that they can continue to use that, plug that in for the output of what you're achieving from that, maybe language translation, and input that into the customer journey in a seamless way. Again, you know, and so th there's both in terms of the benefit of a singular environment where it makes sense for organizations, but again, for enterprise organizations, as you know, you know, very, very well, that they've usually got some pretty long history of engagement and some technology decisions made. And so the reality of actually turning those things off sort of overnight is, is unlikely. So you need to be able to be able to be you know, flexible for an organization and a customer for both what's right, you know, from a total end to end perspective, but also flexible if they want to bring in other third party scenarios as well. Now, customers are often a company's best research and development resource because, you know, they've got pain points that they'd love to get solved or that have been solved, but they can find even more tweaks. So I know you already mentioned some sort of customer requests in terms of the, the contact center type of uh, in, in environment, but are there any customer requests that have become standard and beloved Zoom features over the past few years that really stick in your mind? Yeah, it's actually a close to home customer, Caring For You, um, a wonderful organisation here in Australia, uh, a nursing service care organisation. Uh, they've been a long-standing Zoom customer, real partner actually of ours for many years. Uh, in fact, they were on stage with us at our, our customer experience launch event several weeks ago, which is a huge privilege uh, for us and a number of other customers and analysts on that, that launch event. Uh, and Torben from Caring For You talked about the, the reason why they've They've selected our CX platform and actually migrated already to it. And really for them, it was that end-to-end -end communications collaboration platform and the opportunity to everything that just we've been speaking about, Alex, is to have the options there for different service experiences for different customers. So the use of video over time, SMS becomes really powerful for them as part of a customer journey. Now, one of the really cool parts um, of not only our entire platform, but our development innovation cycle is just the sheer velocity of features. When you think about Zoom Contact Center being launched a year ago, you know, 450 new features just last year alone, 1,500 new platform features and enhancements in 2022 across the entirety of the Zoom platform. It's just incredible pace of, of innovation. And there's an area inside Zoom Contact Center where we've got this uh, customer contact database tool, effectively, almost a you know semi-limited CRM light type thing mm. for particular customers that want to use some of the smarts of technology in the context and natively to, to flag some pieces, you know, maybe some attributes of Alex and Phil. Um, and Karen, if you actually had a few items that they actually wanted to see to uplift that. So from an efficiency point of view, so they could route connections from that consumer, that customer in a, a more elegant way, a more efficient way when they contact them again. And now we took that back to our customer success team into our product house and those, those feature enhancements were actually on the roadmap, but we accelerated them. Now, that, I love to hear that stuff. And what it shows is the intimacy, the importance of customer feedback, that product feature roadmap importance, uh, and, the, and the flexibility, the pace of innovation from our product house and team to respond and, and accelerate that based on a customer that you know, we really value and offered to be a test customer for that feature and functionality. I, I think that example is a really vivid one. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as we get towards the end of the interview, I always like to ask a couple of questions about you. And so my first one is to ask if you could please share a memory of your first computer. And then after that, you know, when do you remember making your first video call? Uh, kind of vividly remember the Atari and Commodore 64. So oh, I'm just yeah. aged like Alex. Yeah, I remember them too. So I'm, I'm also <laughs> aging myself. <laughs> And the Atari was just, and it's one of those things, you know, the power of emotion, isn't it? I, 
I can't even remember the games. I mean, if I thought hard enough, I could probably remember the games. But Asteroid, just the emotion. Pitfall, Pac-Man, yeah, you know, it. all those ones, yeah. <laughs> You're ahead of me. So those two, um, and it was probably just the fun my brother and sister and I are remember having with them a long, long time ago. Tape drive stuff, wasn't it, too? That was yeah, pretty good. Yeah, very, you know, um, I remember the tape drive stuff. Uh, when was video your first call. video call? Yeah. I I don't think I can remember the first video call. I, I would imagine it would have been in modem dial-up days. So I can imagine and visualise the video performance was pretty horrendous, I'd say, though, Alex. Yeah, I remember getting a Connectix quick cam in, nine, in two th 1995. That was before right. Logitech bought it, and it connected via the parallel port, and it was black and white. And at the time, I was working for a <laughs> telco, and I was part of the... the um, the technology division, and I was making little uh, 30 second to one minute video clips, which was being compressed really to a small size and embedded into a PDF, which was being emailed out. So I mean, that was very advanced stuff for its time. I mean, most people weren't doing that. But uh, yeah, I think I had see you, see me or something. And yeah, the, the very jerky video calls. And then of course, you know, Skype and mobile phones that had that changed everything. And now we take video for granted. I mean, Zoom is the word on everybody's lips. <laughs> now, you, you, you beat me. Actually, it's a good point you raised. There was a, a, a really wise person you know, when I joined Zoom uh, nine months ago now, almost, said to me that, you know, that's the uh, the technology impact and, and video as part of that is there's two parts of exactly your point is that video has now been mainstreamed as an it's accepted as a means of communication. But moreover, it's this expectation that's been set, isn't it? And so video accepted and expected. And in fact, at a prior organization about a year ago, I was managing a lot of you know team calls around the world. And um, I'm a big fan of receiving feedback, solicited and unsolicited. It can be confronting sometimes, Alex, isn't it? And yeah. one of the guys in my team was giving some feedback. I used to go for long walks and I'd turn the video off for these team meetings. And he gave me some feedback saying, Phil, when you're not on video, the you know the message that sends is that you care less about the topic that's being talked about. And I thought that was a really, I mean, I loved the feedback. It was exactly what I needed to hear, but it was a really vivid show for me of just how video has changed the way in which, uh, the, again, that expectation and acceptance, isn't it? Uh, really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's also the case where if you're going for a walk, you'd have to hold your phone out in front of you so that people could see you. And this is where I've heard stories about how uh, both with the Meta Quest Pro and also with the upcoming uh, Apple uh, VR headset, that you'll be able to have FaceTime calls, but it'll be a, a virtual avatar of yourself, and the cameras will be looking at your face to um, deliver, uh, you know, the reactions and the emotions that your avatar is going to display. So um, we'll see how that all turns out when it when it comes out. But yeah, th th that you'll be able to be on video without being on video, and then you'll have to find out whether whether that's Best good enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, my second last question is always to simply ask if you could please share some of the best advice you've received in life to help you get where you are today. Yeah, um, well, I certainly uh, people don't listen to me. Um, my eldest is uh, she's 16 and I think she's going through that stage of determining, you know, what path she takes and, you know, career and, and so on. And and, you know, Alex, I don't know, the, there's no um, hard and fast playbook in this. So she's asked me for advice and I've just said to her from a kind of personal and professional point of view, just try and find a pursuit that you really, you love and are passionate about because uh, as a result, you, you'll you work hard and, and be motivated and energised for that. So I think that's probably the, the first thing. Um, and again, professionally on the second piece, look, over the last... Um, and it's synonymous with customer experience, I think, Alex, isn't it? but really over the last 10, 15 years, um, if there's one thing that, you know, you want to do and want to do really, really well is to obsess on the customer. Because I, I think if you do that in all your mental models and decision-making, ideally from a data-driven point of view, and have the customer at the heart, the anchor of the decision, then you invariably get it right. So, yeah, that, that would be my advice. So what is your final message to ITY viewers and readers and to your current and future customers and partners? Yeah, so well, firstly, Alex, thank you. Um, really appreciate the time and the conversation. Really cool. 
um, the way you know, the message I'd say is that the Zoom platform is an extensive portfolio of, of collaboration solutions comprising, again, what we're really famous for, uh, well known for, market leading for around employee experience, the collaboration piece now extending our customer's consumer, our customer's customer into that ecosystem, into that environment from a customer experience point of view. And the way we think about that is if you look at the, not only today, the Zoom platform and the, the breadth of that capability, let alone the innovation speed that we've got on track record and looking into the future, it's the opportunity to think about that from a functional point of view and how do I do that dynamically? So you can have choices for organizations, for customers, and think about delivering so much of the functional view across that stack from an employee and customer experience point of view, organizations that have to maintain, develop, build, and operate a lot of different solutions stitched together, pretty costly, a lot of pain, whereas we like to think and modestly say we've done a lot of the heavy lifting for organizations so they can just grab features and functions where it makes sense from the cloud dynamically so they can focus on what's more important for them, which is their employees and their customers. Well said. Well said. Well, uh, Philip Zamet, the Zoom Head of Customer Experience for Asia Pacific in Japan, thank you very much for taking the time today. Uh, wish you the best of success, and I do hope we can talk again in the future. Wonderful. Thanks, Alex. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.